Uh, welcome everyone. I'm uh, Edo Choi, Assistant Curator of Film at the Museum of the Moving Image, and um, I'm very happy to be joined by cinematographers Eric Lin and Michael Goy uh, to discuss um, the influence of James Wong Howe and um, the uh, industry today and uh, in the past. Um, welcome, uh, Michael, Eric. Thank you. Glad Thank to you. be here. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I wanted to start by just asking you both, and I guess Michael, we can we can start with you. Uh, what relationship you have to um, James Wong Howe's work, um, and uh, how familiar you are with his story and his career? Yeah. Well, and I was um, influenced heavily influenced when I was becoming a cinematographer by the work of two different cinematographers. One was Robert Surtees and the other was James Wong Howe. Um, what impressed me about them is that they were both studio craftsmen who made every film they worked on have a distinct style that was true to the story, regardless of it being pretty. So they were both mavericks in that they could deliver what the studio expected the movie to look like, but in visual ways that were unexpected. Mm -hmm. So I think I first noticed James Wong Howe's work on, on Chandu the Magician, a 1932 movie with Bela Lugosi, which was a very low budget movie. It was more like a serial, but the, the visual innovation in that brought my attention to James Wong Howe. And uh, you know the fact that he was partnered in that movie with, with William Cameron Menzies, who was an, an amazing production designer and, and director. Mm -hmm. I think that the two of them uh, did a, a fantastic job on that. So that was sort of the, the start for me in terms of noticing James Wong Howe's work. I don't know how long you want me to go on for because I could just go on and on. <laughs> no, I'm actually, I wanted to just quickly follow up. What, what um, aspects of how Shandu the Magician was photographed leapt out to you? Well, it, it, it's something that James Wong Howe did really throughout his entire career, which is, which is that he, he told the story. He found ways, he found the simplest way to tell the story. And that flies in the face of, I think, a lot of film students today who are trying to find some style that's visually impressive, you know, some 20 minute unbroken shot or, or whatever like that. Um, but it's not wedded to the material. And the thing about uh, Jimmy's work is, is that you can't separate the visual style that he brought to it in terms of the camera placement, the choice of lenses, the way he lit it from the material because the the style came from the material and you know when i look at um movies like like seconds the uh, the closing moments of seconds um that he did with john frankenheimer director john frankenheimer i stole for something that i was doing on american horror story you know what what he did with rock hudson in the, those closing moments where he gave us a shot that was not a POV and not a shot of, of Rock Hudson, but sort of both at the same time. Mm -hmm. And what it was doing, it was really sucking the audience in to experience what Rock Hudson was going through and not just watching him go, go through it. And so on American Horror Story in season five, when Chloe Sevigny is walking through the hospital corridors, I wanted to get that feeling. And I, I put a six millimeter lens right next to her head so I could see her reaction as well as the hallway and her distorted view of the hallway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, James Wong Howe's work was hugely inspirational to me just in terms of establishing what, what kind of cinematographer I wanted to be as I got into the industry. You know, what was my approach gonna be? Too many people are obsessed with finding their style. The style comes out of the story and the material. And that's something that I learned from Jimmy Wong Howe and Robert Surtees. Um, Eric, could you talk a little bit about, I know that you also uh, cite um, Seconds as something, uh, a film that uh, left a real impression on you. So could you talk a little bit about your relationship to James Longhouse's work? Yeah, um, let's see, I, the first, when I, f I think I first heard about him when I was in undergrad, uh, I studied at UC Berkeley and I did, I volunteered a lot at, um, Asian American film festivals, you know, back then as it was run by Nata. 
Um, and I'd always heard about, you know, we had a lot of the, we had a lot of retrospectives and they always like, I always heard people talking about James Wong Howe. And this was before I knew I wanted to pursue cinematography. And so I was like, you know, read about him, read about his story. And it was very inspirational, you know, like the time that he came up in, uh, the historical circumstances, the de jure, you know, xenophobia and, um, and the fact that he was able to, you know, and changing technology, right? He came from sound era, moved into talkies and, and was still able to rise to the top of his craft. So he was incredibly inspirational just by, before even I knew of, of his work and be, before I'd even seen his work. And then once I started deciding to, once I decided to pursue filmmaking, you know, then I started to pick up on what he was doing in his films. And it became, then it was like, oh, wow. Like not only as a, as a historical figure is it impressive what he did, but, you know, just from a technical level, you know, like what Michael is saying, um, the lighting he was doing at the time, the different styles that he approached each film, like for me, HUD and Seconds, you know, stands out to me. It's such different type of films, different type of visual language. But, uh, you know, as Michael had already said, like it all derived from the story in such an incredible way, in such an intuitive and creative way. Um, and so as a filmmaker, now, like, you know, as I've started to shoot a lot more, um, like what he is, what he was able to accomplish became even more impressive to me, you know, like not only, you know, like the, the, the stuff you face societally, but then to be on set and still be able to command your craft and to have that visual instinct and to implement it and to carry it through and have that discipline. It was, um, it was a, yeah, continues to be an inspiration to this day. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, I think what, what Michael points out is something that always, that James Wan Howe has taught me as well is like how to, cause I found as I, make more films that what I'm interested in is how the story really derives that style, right? How does your filmmaking support the story? And, and you know, he was one of the first DPs I, I read about that he really spoke to that, you know, in his interviews and how he pushed that and, and you know, was able to do it in every film in such an interesting way. Yeah. Um, can, can you uh, cite a moment in Seconds or, or HUD that particularly kind of stood out to you when you saw them or continues to sort of leave an impression on you now? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's incredible, uh, like the visual debt we sort of owe him, right? Like even uh, when, you know, he was pioneering the idea of like the Snorri cam, right? Like tying the camera to the character, like in the opening in Grand Central where they have like, I mean, I don't know how big those cameras were at that point, but like anchored to his over the shoulder. And it wasn't even like how people have, have been using it, in, you know, since Pi, when not where it's like the center frame, you know, punched in a uh, center punched image of the character, like rooted into that perspective, but he was doing something much more like subjective and, you know, disorienting where they he would be like over the shoulder, but fixed to that person's, you know, perspective. Um, but then also, you know, I think a lot of it is, it sounds like from what I read it's pushed by Frankenheimer, but like uh, James Wong Howe was able to take it further. The, the idea of like, hidden cameras, right? They put the cameras in the suitcase as they're walking through Grand Central. Yeah. They had hidden cameras inside like the kiosk booths. And it has this like incredible uh, sense of paranoia and voyeurism that's like being built up just in that opening sequence in Grand Central. And I found that like incredible, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was wondering what you, because I, you know, I, I think that this is a, uh, a, a kind of, um, conventional wisdom in, in I think the, let's say the narrative film business that, uh, that cinematography should serve the story. And I, I'm, um, I'm curious about um, how you interpret that in your work, like how, how that, what that means to you actually on a practical level, because uh, I, I would imagine that one cinematographer and another who both feel that they're serving the story would nonetheless have very different approaches to filming the same scene or the same piece of material. So for you, what does that mean in like concrete terms uh, on any project that you're working on? Uh, either of you can start, I'm curious. Yeah. I'll let Michael go. What? Uh, I'll let Michael go. <laughs> okay, um, you know, the cinematography is is a craft of of interpretation. It it doesn't exist on its own um, unless you you're doing something that's um, 
meditative like uh, there's a marvelous documentary out right now called awaken but um you know when when you get the script and you you think of it i mean i i always think of it like like a symphony orchestra when uh, the script gets uh, passed or the uh, sheet music gets passed around it goes to five different conductors, you're gonna get five different interpretations of the exact same material because that's filtered through their sensibility and what they see as the story or the through line in the music. And it's the same thing with cinematography and, and directing. Everybody gets the same script, but the point of view that you bring to it is, is uniquely your own based on your experiences and how you, what you think of that character and how you think that character feels. I mean, you know, when I look at uh, like uh, Jimmy's work on Sweet Smell of Success, there are a lot of ways that you could approach that milieu of that undercurrent, that underbelly of, of the publicist's world and the machinations that go on with this, the political figures and, and the manipulation of the innocent people in, in that realm. And the choices that you make as a cinematographer, the choices that he made as the cinematographer on, on that movie are uniquely his own and, and reflect his views of those characters. And, and it's, not, it's not that he has hate for those characters. I think it's very difficult as a cinematographer to hate somebody or to hate a character and photograph them. You need to understand them on a deeper level than that. So when we get into Burt Lancaster's world and Sweet Smell of Success, yes, there is the, the sordidness of how he manipulates people, but it's also cloaked in, in kind of the power and the glamour that gives us an idea of, of why he's in it, you know, how he moves through it, what other people are attracted to about it. So it's, it's not just the sordidness, there's other layers to it. And that's the thing that, that, that Jimmy Wong Hao did brilliantly. He didn't give us a surface interpretation of what the character is feeling. He gave us an in-depth idea of what the character is feeling and how they see the world. And that becomes then the audience's point of view. That becomes what the audience experiences when they watch the movie. Eric, I'm, I'm curious uh, how you would answer the question as well. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's similar. You know, like I find that in prep when I'm, when I'm shooting a feature and, you know, I think the most enjoyable times is when I'm talking with the director and we're talking about we're not talking about technical aspects, right? We're talking about what's the character going through, what's their trajectory, and what's um, and how do we represent that visually, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, it's it, as Michael said, it's all interpretive. And but we're you know, I think I and uh, you know, it sounds like Michael as well, and, and Jimmy Wong how kind of like our approach was always like, how do we use the visual language to bring about that kind of like subjectivity, right? Like, what's the subtext? What's going on? It's not just like how do we cover a scene, right? It's like, what's that thing underneath it? Um, and I think, you know, for me, that's what I, I think, you know, James Wong Howe talks about when he talks about like the style comes from the story. It's like, you're getting into this, like what's this character's journey and how do we use these visual elements, everything, lighting, depth of field, camera movement to, to bring that about, you know? And like, I think about HUD and how, so different, how it's so different than seconds. And what I love about HUD is just the, how the, the shots, how the shots are created through blocking, you know, and it's about how people's relationship in space is changing and moving and, and how, you know, um, Paul Newman's character, you know, th there's moments where he's like stands up, stands apart from the rest of the family, you know, they create these shots, you know, where he moves apart and, and it's, it's incredibly subtle because not a lot of it is fancy camera work, right? It's like knowing where the camera is going to be, you know, sometimes they're pulling back into like a four shot or three shot. Um, but it's also letting, letting that idea of just like committing to letting the actors and the relationships kind of drive the camera movement is, is an approach that's so, you know, deeply psychological. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, you know, that's the kind of like thought that he brought into his craft. And, I, you know, it's still inspirational when I see his work. Yeah, a lot of his work throughout his career, regardless of the, the style of, that predominated at the time, is working within those styles to convey, as you're, as both of you are putting this kind of layered story information or character information, psychological value. Um, and 
Oh, actually, I, I guess one of the kind of, you know, the way he himself would talk about cinematography, um, he particularly put an emphasis on lighting. Uh, I think that that's true throughout his his career. Um, and, and he would talk about, especially some of the late interviews that are conducted with him, he, he talks about how much less time there, there had there had become for lighting on sets um, and how that was creating a new kind of cinematographer. Um, so I was, I was actually wanted to ask a question about present kind of conditions in the business and on, on sets these days um, with respect to lighting and, and, and how uh, lighting works today. Um, do, do you find that there's, um, first of all, just time blocked out for uh, lighting and how important is that kind of viewed today as as a storytelling tool? Well, as a cinematographer, I think, uh, you know, your responsibility to deliver what's expected of the show that you're working on in terms of the visual style and your ability to marshal the resources and command the crew in a way that gets you to that that goal in as short as amount of time as possible within budget within schedule and all that stuff is uh kind of finding that balance is is the work of the cinematographer and yeah. you know i i i find that that i have i i and i never have enough time money or resources to do what i i actually intended to do so i compromise you know as we all do we compromise but you know i I like to to compromise in bold, audacious ways. I always say that, you know, I've created an entire career out of making enormous compromise look like an intentional style. Like when you watch it, you cannot imagine that that's not what I originally intended to do. So that's that's what I do, and all of that comes from the story because there's not one way to shoot a scene. There's there's hundreds of ways to shoot a scene but your mind has to be open to the possibilities of, okay, I can't do this. So instead of doing a scaled down version of this, which is gonna look like a half-assed version of something that was a good idea, I'm gonna throw that away and I'm gonna go in a completely different direction that still tells the story. Yeah. And you know, when, when people watch my work on American Horror Story and they comment, wow, the, the, that scene where they were wearing the black dresses and everything was dark around them and it, it, the room fell off to almost nothing and stuff that was really great and stuff like that well it was not my intended way to shoot the scene you know I ran out of time one of those actors had to get on a plane you know so I I, I very rarely use more than three lights I in that case I had one light and I was holding it and I said shoot shoot right now and everything else fell off and it becomes the style yeah. but you can only make those educated choices those educated decisions if you know the story as as well as as anybody you know as well as the director and you understand what will work visually for that particular story yeah and i think i think you know also with digital cameras what they are now like sony venice dual iso there's this expectation that you can shoot without lighting right there's a lot of like practically driven i feel like i see a lot of films and, and shows that are like practically driven um and you know i think it's deceptive how much craft is involved in shooting with available light right especially if you're shooting 2500 iso you're like flagging everything like you're shooting on a street you have like a street light four lights down that will still cast a shadow of your camera onto the actor and you got to block that out like right. the, the the type of like craft involved is, is different but i think because of the the highest of cameras you know there is this expectation you can shoot with much less and much more quickly and i think you know it, it is it is about so much of it is about management time management but also expectations and like uh i, I just did a netflix film that we wanted to harken back to like you know romantic comedies like studio romantic comedies so we want to like with big big fresnels you know um 20ks 10ks and you know that took time and so to really fight against the expectation of like line producers, like, oh, well, you just do everything LEDs and available light and it would be fine, right? But it's like, no, we want condors, we want, you know, we want generators. Um, but we had to, in order to, you know, execute that plan, we had to schedule it out in a way that we could execute it so they're not waiting on us, right? And if we could show that we could do it with this plan, then it's like, okay. But, you know, it is fighting against this momentum of like, oh, well, you know, you're 
cameras are so sensitive. You don't need this. You don't need that. But it's like there's a look and a style and intention and you got to keep keep fighting for that when you can. I was wondering if you, um, either of you um, or both of you, kind of view yourselves as what your relationship is to uh, um, cinematography of the past. Do you view yourself as sort of part of a lineage? Um, and, you know, no, I don't mean specifically when it comes to James Wong How I just mean the relationship you feel to film history um, as craftspeople or as, as artists. Um, do you, do you, are you consciously aware of kind of being part of a lineage or kind of an evolution of um, filmmaking style or looks? Um, or is this something that, you know, is, is more something that you might reflect on after a project or something like that? Well, as, as any crew member who's worked with me will probably tell you, um, I, I believe that every, everything that we do today that we think of as an astounding innovation was actually done in the 1920s yeah. at some point. <laughs> you know, the, the, the techniques of, of visual storytelling and how you incorporate your lens choices, how you incorporate potential visual effects elements in it. In the 1920s, a lot of that was pioneered before the advent of sound came you know in the late 20s and we we are doing adaptations of of those same kinds of ideas or those same approaches today using technology that's that's much more advanced you know i uh, right now i'm working on on a huge virtual production show for netflix uh avatar the last airbender where we're doing it on on big led screens well shooting screens or shooting using them as background and stuff is not anything new that was done in the 1920s yeah. you know it's just we've advanced the technology to the point where the resolution can be incredibly high mm -hmm. so i i feel like a lot of what i do on every project is is heavily influenced by by 1920s filmmaking specifically from the works of fw murnau and buster keaton uh, those two, but also, you know, you know, what Jimmy Wong Howe was doing in, in, in his silent movie era was really groundbreaking too, when he would do movies like uh, Peter Pan, you know, and how he depicted that fantasy world or, or, you know, even, uh, you know, a, a Clara Bow thing like Man Trap, you know, you see the, the distinctive style in, in it. So, um, yeah, I, I think, I think I would have, I would have really had fun in the 1920s as a cinematographer. That's kind of where my mind goes. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, a lot of my filmmaking ideas are steeped in tradition. So I, I think I, I think a lot about how films were made and how I, I don't know, maybe I have a mis, misplaced nostalgia considering I, you know, I never made films in the, the, the 50s or 40s. Um, but that there was a time where they they could be, you know, innovative in a way that was so, I don't know, you know, they were sort of maverick, they could, they could be mavericks, like, you know, James Wong Howe, like, got into a wheelchair, you know, at that time, it was like shooting, you know, he was getting on roller skates, shooting a boxing scene, like, he, he was able to, like, do these things where now, like, technology almost makes those things too easy, and, like, <laughs> we have to be creative in different ways, um, but I, you know, I, I, learn filmmaking uh shooting film and I also like that's always in the back of my mind and like to see now like where technology goes is like I'm trying to like always make sure that how I'm using that new technology kind of like you know supports the foundations that I learned as opposed to like I don't know trying out the, the always the next thing maybe I'm just more cautious when it comes to technology especially digital technology so um I feel like I'm much more conservative in my approach and and I think that comes from that like kind of learning you know, I, I felt like I learned how to make films by reading American Cinematographer and, you know, trying to figure out how, you know, hearing how people like figured it out. And it's so interesting. And, and, and uh, yeah, so I think a lot of my approach, uh, even with, with, you know, the evolving technology is still rooted in that kind of traditional filmmaking. Right. Do, do you, yeah, this actually leads to another question I had, which is, do, do you feel that it is, when you look at a visual reference um, from an earlier film, uh, how easy is it for you to know how 
something was achieved, how an effect was achieved, how a look was achieved without, especially when we don't have documentation for how something was done. I mean, with James Wong Howe, there's interviews where he talks a little bit about certain effects, like with Peter Pan, he talks how he achieved the Tinkerbell um, effect. Uh, but he, but often I think for earlier film, a lot of our record of how things were done is lost. I mean, we, we have a sense of things. We have like John Alton's painting with light. We, we have some sense of, you know, some records of uh, how certain effects were, um, were, were worked out. But often I get the sense, at least as, um, as a scholar that present day cinematographers have to reconstruct how, how, how certain um, uh, things were done. And so I'm curious, do you feel that way? Do you feel it's that your knowledge kind of gives you a good sense of, oh, okay, they must have been using this kind of setup? Um, or do you think that it, is it more of, does it involve more detective work? Well, I mean, I mean, if you look at the, the movies of Carol Zeman, the, the Czech director, they're, they're incredible. I still haven't figured out, you know, yeah. how he, he did the, what he did in, in those movies. Um, Invention of Destruction, you know, those, those films, Baron Munchausen. But for me, it's, it's less about knowing exactly how they achieved what they did and instead being influenced by how they made me feel. Mm -hmm. with the images that they they came up with and you know I, I remember when when I was shooting a movie about the Atlanta child murders and there's a nightmare sequence where the director and I had talked about the the dead children being in the room and their eyes are glowing and I remembered that Dante Spinotti did that in in Manhunter mm -hmm. and I I called up Dante and and I, I said hey mm -hmm. How did you do that effect of you know, the glowing eyes in, in Manhunter? And he said to me, oh, well, Michael, how do you think I did it? <laughs> and I said, well, if I was going to venture a guess, I'd, I'd say maybe maybe it was Scotchgard, a reflective material that was taped to the, uh, the actor's eyes. And you shot it through a 6040 beam splitter with a bright light source, you know, that kicked back into the camera. And he says, that's exactly how I did it. <laughs> and, you know, the... Uh, the thing is, it wasn't really about just knowing exactly technically how he did it, but the, the fact that what he did was an inspiration to me and, and I could process it in, in different ways and figure out what way would work with the production that, that I was working on. Yeah. So, you know, it's when we were influenced by other people's work, um, I think we're more influenced by the feeling that they made us feel with the yeah. work that they created mm -hmm. yeah i mean i would say in my case uh it uh, like i love research so i'm always doing detective work like i don't i don't think it, I, I think it's difficult for me to see something and say like oh i know exactly yeah. how to do it but the there's a lot of joy in that kind of detective work you know for yeah. me um like even just about seconds like when i read i think it was like an asc magazine article or something about uh, the shooting of it and how they were so close to actors they had to like shoot non-sync sound right because like the ca camera was so close and so loud but it adds to the hallucinatory effect of the the whole film you know when the camera is that close and it's like non-sync dialogue and it's like oh yes like it, it's fascinating to me that that I don't know if they planned always to do non-sync sound or like in the shooting of it they discovered that but it, it's like such a perfect you know perfect effect mm -hmm. um and, it, and it's always like such a joy and revelation to, to hear those little things like, oh yeah, like it, that's how they discover that moment or that thing. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, I'm curious, do you both have uh, moments where you feel you, you pulled something off under the conditions that you had to work that was particularly, that you're particularly proud of that you think was kind of particularly, innovative or just creative? Well, I think probably Eric and I do that on a daily basis. <laughs> you know, it's, it's part of one of your survival tools as a cinematographer in this industry. You know, the case in point on, on the show that I'm working on right now, um, 
there was a, a there's a sequence where uh, a boat with two people on it gets swept into this massive ice cave and, and it collides on this wave of water and collides uh, onto this uh, ice shelf where they get thrown out of the boat and stuff like that. And in pre-production, we were talking about that shot and visual effects was telling me how expensive it's going to be with these water effects being very specific and all this stuff and we're shooting on stage, mm -hmm. you know. And I said, you know, we'll we'll do it like this. You know, we'll we'll have the the virtual production image of the ice cave in the background. We'll have the physical ice shelf that they collide into. The boat will just get pulled on on water ropes on wheels across the the stage floor. And in the foreground, we'll put a four foot water trough. And a couple of uh, people will just dump buckets of water in it and we'll shoot it with a split diopter. And the wave of water in the foreground will look like it's carrying the boat over there and then they'll collide into it. And they said, you know, is that going to work? And I said, it worked in the 1920s. You know, <laughs> I've done it before. It's going to work. And they said, great. OK, great. You know, and we did it. It was the first shot we did on the first day. Set it up, split wow. diopter, water four foot water pool they poured buckets of water in there and the waves swept it over and they crashed in there and it looked great mm -hmm. and they said wow it's really great that you 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 done that before and knew how to do that i said i'd never done that before <laughs> it just seemed like it would work in theory it worked in the 1920s you know in, in movies that i saw and 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 you know so we're using a lot of these same techniques you know yeah. even mixed with with high technology there there's there's a cut and paste kind of thing that filmmaking i think should never give up that it can be made by hand because as soon as we give that up then as as cinematographers especially i feel like we've conceded a large portion of our craft to to other disciplines to to visual effects or post-production or whatever you know so you you need to kind of keep a little bit of a hands-on uh feeling to what you do yeah yeah see i, I did a film I, I can't wait to see that shot by the way <laughs> sounds incredible <laughs> um but this sort of this sort of touches on um what we're talking about about you know uh style deriving from story um i did this film called sound of silence um, the Peter Sarsgaard is leading. And it, it's the first time I had done something like this, but we, we you know, uh, Peter Sarsgaard plays, um, it's a fictional story, but uh, he plays a, a guy who goes into people's apartments in New York City and tunes them, right? If they are suffering from depression, he'll like listen to your audio soundscape and it'd be like, oh, your toaster's in E flat. I'm gonna change that. And then, you know, you'll no longer be depressed. Um, and so because the whole film is kind of like based on audio, it was like, what's the visual approach, right? And we arrived at this kind of like style where we started subtracting visual information, right? And the hope, you know, like we were playing with very, very low exposure, very shallow depth of field, very like low bandwidth of color. You know, we stayed within like grays and browns and, um, and blacks. And, you know, the whole kind of approach suddenly became about how do we make people sort of like listen Right, because if we start to subtract visual information, then the audio landscape, audio uh, soundscape, hopefully starts to like take over. Mm -hmm. um, and and so it's it's something I'm proud of because I think, you know, I hope that this like overarching kind of like macro approach to the visual supported the story and the character because it starts to like become about how do we how do we like push audio and listening to the forefront. But I'm also like very like happy with how it looks visually. It's like kind of very different than other films I had done where it's super low exposure. You know. We, we um we shot one scene where this is actually dumb luck so it doesn't you know i don't i can't claim any technical credit but we were supposed to shoot a scene where it was a blackout in the city uh and we shot on this rooftop in brooklyn um and it was incredible though we totally lucked out because it was a misty night and just there was enough ambient light bouncing off the mist to like to make them out and it and it felt like more natural than anything i would have done you know any sort of like edge light or like soft like that I was planning on doing we were like oh like I, I just told everybody like it was a it was like a fifth floor walk up and we had like pre-rig crew like hauling all this gear up and then I had to tell them like we're not going to use any of it because it looks amazing right now um <laughs> and but it, it was this just moment of like pure dumb luck that like we were shooting this blackout scene it was misty and it was just like all this ambient light was just bouncing off them you could barely make out Rashida Jones's face and Peter Sarsgaard's face but in the most like natural perfect way um 
So that's something I'm proud of, but I can't like claim credit for other than to like tell people not to use the lights we have brought up. Well, even knowing when not to do, <laughs> not to add light, I, I, I would imagine is a real skill and like takes, takes experience um, to not interfere uh, with like natural conditions. Um, I, I wanted to just kind of, we don't have much time left, but I wanted to ask, um, you know, a final question. Um, you know, we, we invited both of you um, uh, as Asian American cinematographers. Um, and, uh, uh, and I, I wanted to ask, you know, not just um, how important James Wong Howe is as an inspiration working at a time when there was um, a great deal of uh, racial discrimination in the business, but also how you feel the industry is now, because I think that these uh, problematics remain. Um, and I'm curious whether uh, you see them work in your specific uh, corner of the industry um, and how you see them at work. Eric, you wanna go first or should I? Sure, uh, yeah, I can, I can jump in. Um, yeah, you know, the, the racial reckoning, you know, in 2020, I think it had a profound, you know, profound effect on America, but, you know, I, I see it also in how people are talking about diversity on film crews, you know, and it's something that I'm, I embrace as I, you know, go from project to project. And, and I've also had like production kind of like mention it as something that they're, you know, prioritizing and, you know, uh, pushing diversity, encouraging it and, and, you know, putting it at the forefront. Um, and it's something I, I stand behind too. You know, I try to work with diverse crews and, you know, try to bring that when I can. Um, you know, and, and it, it was something I like just thinking about James Wong Howe before we, you know, um, we're doing this talk is, you know, it, it's interesting to me because a lot of my very close DP friends who I call up who, you know, we complain about everything together, you know, are Asian American DPs. And we just have this understanding of our kind of like our this shared understanding of our viewpoint about work and like how we approach culture and creation and and being creative. And I realized like James Wong Howe never had anything like that, or maybe he did with other actors or something, but he didn't have like you know as far as I knew, and, and I'm happy to be corrected. Um, you know, a fellow DP who was also Asian American or even minority who he could have that kind of like shared discussions with that beyond just like purely technical or whatever yeah. and and I and, and for me you know that's that's they you know you know these DPs I speak with they they we came up together and so we you know we share a lot of experiences and we have that kind of like camaraderie um but I'm, I'm curious who his confidence were you know and who he yeah. like kind of shared that experience with because I think that that helps us right like being a DP is a very lonely experience because it's very rare you get to see other DPs work and you're always talking about it after the fact and like learning from other people after the fact but it's it's like when you're in the moment, who can you call up and, and talk about these things? And, you know, yeah, I always think about who he had. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that camaraderie is is the reason why the American Society of Cinematographers Clubhouse is so great. You know, you, we could just sit there and chat with other cinematographers about what we've done and, and what they've done and stuff. But I would I would say in the industry because I'm the co-chair of the diversity task force for the the Directors Guild of America. Mm -hmm. um, in the industry, we're getting better. You know, we're making strides toward inclusion and equity and, and diversity in in the industry, and it's been a long time coming. The world is is a whole other matter. You know, in the last five years, I've had many 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 thousands more instances of anti-Asian. Uh, sentiment sent to me through, you know, uh, social messaging, uh, you know, emails, encounters on the street, and stuff. So we've we've definitely gone kind of backward as as yeah. a society, as a world global society, in that respect. Um, you know, I think James Wong Howe was working uh, at the time. You know, when you look at the the caliber of directors that he worked with, all the top directors, Raul Walsh, Walsh, Michael Curtiz, John Frank, you know, all these people who, despite whatever personal, you know, things, biases or whatever they, they may have had, you know, respected first and foremost that he was an incredible craftsman, that he knew his job in a way unlike 
any other cinematographer that they might have been able to work with at that time and insisted on working with him. And so his his legacy, you know, there's there's that that very famous story that when he became very popular as a cinematographer, he bought his mother a Chinese restaurant. And the uh, local newspaper sent a, a photographer around to take a photo of, of them in front of, of the restaurant. And the photographer didn't know who, who Jimmy was, you know, and, and the photographer was posing him and his mother right next to the window of the restaurant. And Jimmy said, why don't we stand away from the restaurant a little bit? And that way you can see the entire restaurant and behind. And the photographer said, hey, I'm the photographer. I'll take the picture. You just worry about your noodles. You know, it's, it's that, that kind of a thing that I'm sure that he had to, to deal with, uh, you know, throughout his, his life, because, you know, I'm dealing with it now, you know, in a way that I never thought I, I would have to, but, you know, your, your craft endures and, and, you know, to a large degree, I think what we do, Eric, myself, all, all the other Asian cinematographers, directors, or whatever, is is we're representing what what our heritage is and what we do in in subtle ways just by the fact that we're present now you know we're we're a growing force in the industry and we're not invisible anymore so that's going to have an effect yeah you know and yeah what, what, sorry yeah. go ahead oh no no i just wanted to to throw in one one thing one bone I have to pick <laughs> about James Wong Howe and, and his work is a lot of people don't know that James Wong Howe shot the live action sequences of the narrator for Walt Disney's Fantasia. Yeah. And the way he shot it was to, to present the, the narrator as a very uh, shrouded uh, figure. He's cloaked in shadow. So there is a mystery and a grandeur about it, about the presentation of, of the announcer. And, and it gave a gravitas to that movie that was really special. In the home video versions, you know, all the home video versions that are out right now, the, uh, they brightened it up. They, they took the original negatives and they brightened them up. So now it's just a guy sitting and standing in a penguin suit yakking at you. And it lost all, a lot of what made that, that movie special so i'm hoping at some point <laughs> disney will go back to what uh, jimmy did in his original photography and present it properly yeah disney they have a habit of of doing this i feel um i i wanted to ask one uh follow-up quickly uh because we started this with uh the notion that you know cinematography should serve the story and i I do, I, I do, um, uh, you know, believe you that it's things are better in the industry and representation within the actual working field. But then there's the matter of what stories are represented and what stories um, are promoted. And I was wondering if you've had moments um, in your work uh, where you've been presented with material that you um, either found offensive or objectionable and had to um, tweak it or push back against how something was being um, put forth. Um, and, uh, or even, even if not, if you haven't had those moments, how you feel about particularly Asian representation, but just representation of um, minority characters in, in uh, Hollywood films and narrative films today generally. Eric, you want to jump yeah. in? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I feel like it's, I feel like there has been an opening in terms of like, uh, you know, stories of under, under, underrepresented uh, folks in America. Like, I feel like, uh, I don't know if it's like because the streaming appetite since COVID has opened up that like people are becoming more open to different types of stories, but I, I do feel like I'm seeing more diverse stories out there. Um, and, and that's exciting to me. And I think that's that's a great movement and hopefully it keeps, you know, continues to go. Um, and I, I've, I've read scripts. I don't think I've ever shot scripts where I, I had some sort of issue with um, Asian American representation. 
but I certainly like read scripts that had issues. And I feel like you could, I don't know, at least those, like I could tell they were not the type of filmmakers I would want to work with. You know, like if someone's open for that kind of discussion, I, I mean, I think you can tell in the interview that they're, that's like something that's on their mind and that that's something that they'd be open to discussing, but you can also tell where it, it's not, <laughs> you know, it's not something that they care about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like, I can't think of like a, a project I've worked on that has had that kind of, uh, that I've had that kind of uh, experience with. Yeah. Yeah, I think Eric is exactly right. In the interview phase or when you, you get the script, you you kind of know um, whether this is something you should be doing or, or not, not wanting to do. Um, I remember when I, when I was starting out, I interviewed with a, a director. It was going to be the director's first movie. And and he had seen my reel and he said, you know, there's something, you know, I, you've done very nice work, but there's something about you I just don't care for. And, you know, he says, you, you seem like somebody who's very confident and is used to being in charge. And it needs to be clear to everybody on the crew that I'm the one in charge because I'm the director. And so I don't know that this is going to work. And I told him, I said, you know, you're, you're right. This isn't going to work because, you know, he, he didn't really care about his movie, the story he was going to tell. He cared about everybody looking up to him as the director and, yeah. and having that ego trip. And, you know, and he's exactly the kind of person that I would murder in the desert in the middle of the night <laughs> off in a distant location, because nothing deflates me faster than knowing that I care more about the movie that we're making than the director does. So, you know, it's, it's, as we find our way through this industry, the, the thing that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm doing Avatar because, and I had to bail on another project that I was contracted to do in order to do this, but I thought it was important to tell this story that had entirely Asian faces in it, to, to show my kids that heroes can look like them. And it was one of the driving reasons that, that I, I went ahead and, and did this project. Mm -hmm. But I, I also feel that um, if, if Jimmy Wong Hao was limited to only working on, on projects that had a cultural significance, an Asian cultural significance and stuff like that, he would not have achieved what he did in the industry in that way. You know, the industry is, is, is bigger than just, you know, the, those stories that we want to tell about our heritage. And you have to, I think, be able to, to get accepted by the industry as a whole, you know, on whatever projects that, that they're doing. And, you know, and then you find those opportunities when you're in positions of power or influence to, to bring, you know, those specific stories that you want to tell to the forefront. And it's something that, you know, all, all of my friends, Asian friends who are in the industry understand. Mm -hmm. I need to be in the game, you know, in order to change the game, the rules of the game. Yeah, to, to build on that, like um, uh, the next project I'm doing actually is a much smaller indie film that's also Asian American. And, you know, Michael said something that made me think about this. It's like, as, as a DP, you know, I came up through the ranks and, you know, was able to work on bigger projects uh, and I'm able to go back and do smaller projects and bring that kind of like experience and like contacts and connections with the industry and hopefully support these smaller films that I care about, you know, and it's, it's a great um, project called Transplant uh, that came up through Sundance Labs. And, you know, I think it's going to be an important film. And but it's also like, you know, taking on it, being able to support a smaller film by, I mean, I want to do it, but also that I can bring that kind of like industry, whatever, connections through camera rental, you know, the post-production houses and have them kind of like get behind this project also. You know, I think it's like something I see as like hopefully helpful too to like getting more Asian American stories out there. I want to thank you both for joining with us uh, this afternoon. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for tuning in and uh, watching and participating in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.